Hey everybody, welcome back to another midweek online Bible study together. Hope you've had a great week so far and uh, hope you're ready tonight to jump into God's Word together and explore some more of the Messianic prophecies, the prophecies that point us towards the promised Messiah. We started this new series last week, just had one lesson. So if you missed that, you can always uh, find it on our YouTube channel, Corridor Community Church. It should be on our Facebook page there somewhere as well. But if you have trouble, just message us, reach out, and we will send you the link so you can see the first lesson, which looked at some of the earliest prophecies uh, all the way back to Genesis uh, about the promised Messiah. As I said last week, we're looking ahead to Christmas. The countdown, I guess, is officially on now. <laughs> So this study helps us in our hearts, in our faith, to answer the question why we believe that Jesus is who he says he is. So as we explore together over the next few weeks leading up to Christmas, it'll take us to about the week before, I pray that you'll join along each week, that you'll take those 20 minutes, half an hour, we're together, Look at God's Word. You have your Bible with you, I hope, uh, as you're just sitting in your living room or in your kitchen with your coffee, your tea. It's pretty casual. Joining me, working through Scripture, asking God to speak to us through His Word and reveal to us some of these incredibly important truths about who Jesus is. So let's start with some prayer. Then we will get right to it tonight. Father, I thank you today again for your great blessings towards us. Lord, we thank you for your word today. And we ask that as we look into it now for these next moments together, that you would be with us by your spirit. You would teach us, speak to us, that we would have an ear to hear what you would say to us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, the promised Savior and Messiah. Help us as we explore these next few weeks to appreciate the greatness of who he is the impact that he has made in our lives and upon the world. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I have my notes. I have my Bible with me. So I'm ready and hopefully you're ready as well to join along. Uh, we're going to start with what is probably uh, the most incredible prophecy today uh, about the birth of the Messiah. Today's lesson will be all around the birth of the Messiah, the prophecies that point us towards us knowing that Jesus is truly the promised Savior, the promised Messiah. So we're going to turn into Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. I'm already there, so I've got to jump on you, a jump start. Look at Isaiah chapter 7, and we're going to look at a few verses here. Isaiah 7, uh, verses 10 through 14. And as I said, this, this lesson today in particular is all about the birth of Jesus. So Christmas is coming. Are you excited about Christmas? Have you got your tree up yet? <laughs> or are you your Christmas music playing in your homes? We've got a few things happening in our house. Everyone is quite excited this year to look forward to Christmas. And of course, hoping and praying we'll spend some time together with family. Uh, that the restrictions will allow for us to do that together in person. So uh, keep believing for that. Keep, keep looking forward and being hopeful. But let's read together Isaiah 7. Uh, I'm going to start at verse 10. It says, Later the Lord sent this message to King Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation. Make it as difficult as you want, as high as the heavens or as deep as the place of the dead. But the king refused. No, he said, I will not test the Lord like that. So Isaiah said, listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? But must you exhaust the patience of God as well? All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel which is God with us. Now this is a strange passage which many of us just simply know verse 14 of what we just read, the promise of 
a Messiah who would be born of a virgin, Emmanuel. And so as I was about to say, or maybe I said it, that Jesus being born of a virgin is one of the most incredible prophecies of his birth. And many people have difficulty even still believing it today. But we see it here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. What's, what's strange about the, about the passage is that the backdrop upon which it's given. King Ahaz, who's one of the wickedest kings of Judah's history, um, led the people to idolatry and even offered his own sons as sacrifices to pagan gods. This guy was not not God-fearing or God-honoring in any way. But Isaiah comes with a message from, from God as the Assyrians are marching on God's people and other, two other kings ask King Ahaz to join with them in an alliance to, to stand up against the Assyrians. And God comes with a message to King Ahaz and says, listen, if you trust me, your enemies will fall to you. But if the people continue to live in sin and you don't, then, then you, will, you will lose, you'll be defeated. And then he offers King Ahaz to ask anything as a sign that God is, is who he says he is. And it's, it's almost too good to be true. Just ask for anything, as high as the heavens or as, as deep as, as hell, and I'll do it as a sign to you. And King Ahaz refuses. He says, I'm not gonna test God this way. Now, it sounds like a spiritual response, but in reality, uh, if we had to think through and know some of the history of what's going on here, it's more likely that King Ahaz already has decided to side with the Assyrians in this upcoming conflict. But nonetheless, Isaiah then proclaims this incredible prophecy on the backdrop of all of this this strange conflict and tension. And so Isaiah's words are then more of, not so much an invitation, but more of a prediction. He says, here's the sign that God is going to give you then, that a virgin will conceive and bear a son. And in due time, some hundreds of years later, well, we're going to read how this prophecy, in fact, comes true. So let's jump to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. Give you a chance to get there. So Matthew 1, verses 22 to 25. Some of this, again, will be quite familiar to many of us as Christmas is approaching. We've heard these passages read and, and sung about and studied in, in churches all during Christmas. But we have to put the pieces together here in studying and looking at God's Word to truly appreciate how this falls into place. Verse 22 of Matthew 1 says, All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through His prophet. Look, a virgin will conceive a son. She will give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And when Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. He didn't have sexual relations with her until the son was born, and then Joseph named him Jesus. Here in Matthew's Gospel, it actually includes the very prophecy we just read from, from Isaiah, hundreds of years prior, and the angel is actually referring to this prophecy that the virgin birth of Jesus was of the promised Messiah. Without the virgin birth, Jesus is simply born as a, as a man, as a human being, much like every other person is born naturally with a father and a mother. But the virgin birth sets him apart because he is divinely conceived. He is a natural mother who births him, Mary, but Joseph is not the natural father. God divinely creates Jesus to be a man, flesh, God with us in the flesh. God himself born to Mary. It's unimaginable to a skeptic or to a doubter. And in fact, it will often even 
bring mockery and rejection, the very story of Christmas, of Jesus being born to a virgin, to a virgin woman. And as believers, we ought to embrace this incredibly important piece of biblical prophecy about the Messiah and have the same resolve as Joseph shows, which we just read in Matthew chapter 1. We may have thought about it before, how difficult a position Joseph was really in. Here it tells us that he takes Mary to be his wife, even knowing that, you know, by her conceiving a child, becoming pregnant before they've been married will bring about all kinds of criticism and questions. And it goes further to tell us that he doesn't have sexual relations with her, with his wife, until the son is born. And so he honors and, and lives by, by faith, what he's told by the messenger from God, by the angel. And so we ought to have this same conviction about this important piece of prophecy about Jesus' arrival and his birth, that he truly was born of a virgin. Now, the second piece of prophecy we'll look at today concerning the arrival and the birth of the Messiah is about where he would be born. And so let's flip back to the Old Testament in Micah. And you don't have to go far from Matthew. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. It says, But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant past. So Bethlehem, again, a, a known uh, detail of the Christmas story that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, was also a very important prophecy about the Messiah that we can see as we fit it together in the story of Jesus. Bethlehem was a small town insignificant in the region of Judah. But it wasn't just about population, it was more about their their position, their what people perceived to be Bethlehem. It was a lowly area, a lowly region. The people were not regarded highly as people who came from Bethlehem. You might think of people in the area in which you live. There might be certain areas of town or certain towns within your region that people judge similarly, that they look down upon. And so Bethlehem was, was kind of like this. And Micah gives this prophecy very specifically to say that Bethlehem would produce this ruler. And he would come from ancient times. It, it, it's telling us again of Jesus, of the Messiah, that would, that would span time and eternity. But he would be born in this very small, insignificant region. It's important because it's, it's specific, so specific that there would be some who would falsely claim that they might be the Messiah. That, or that they would know someone who could potentially be the Messiah. Those in ancient times of Jewish faith that would be looking for this promised Savior might point to this person or that. But the prophecy from Micah narrows it down to say that this Messiah, this promised Savior is coming from Bethlehem, will be born in Bethlehem. Now let's jump back to Matthew again and go this time to chapter 2 as we read about how this this prophecy is fulfilled in the New Testament. Matthew 2, starting at verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. And it was during the reign of King Herod, about the time when some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem. They were asking, where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose. So we've come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, and as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called 
a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law, and he asked them, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Verse 5, In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, This is what the prophet wrote, that you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. That's the prophecy from Micah we just read. So, here's what's interesting. The wise men, again, are, are popular characters in the Christmas story, in the story of Jesus. And they're, what we understand is descendants from the wise men going all the way back to the time when Daniel and the wise men, wise young people of, of Israel were held captive by the Babylonians. So, through the years and generations, these wise men knew enough about, about ancient literature and prophecy to know that a king would be born of the Jews, which is actually a prophecy out of Numbers 24, 17, one of the prophecies that we won't look there today. But they didn't know enough to know the Micah prophecy that would say he would be born in Bethlehem. And so the star, which again we often will talk about during Christmas, that led the wise men, eventually would lead them to Bethlehem. But at first, it leads them to, well, they end up in Jerusalem. They follow it so far, maybe they lose the track of the star, who knows, but they end up in Jerusalem. And they ask King Herod, where's the king of the Jews that was born? We're here to worship him. He, may, may, he must be in Jerusalem. That's where all of the activity of faith and religion goes on. So that's, that's where we'll go. And when they ask King Herod, of course, then we know what we just read, and it's a popular uh, theme of, of the Christmas story. King Herod is not pleased about the prospect of a king being born that might challenge his rule. In fact, King Herod was a jealous king, one that was was paranoid enough to have his own sons killed when they sought too much power. And it wasn't only King Herod. It says that all of Jerusalem wasn't very pleased to hear about this. Maybe we didn't quite get that when we've heard the Christmas story before, but the reason being is that King Herod's supporters who wanted to find favor with Rome, who wanted to continue living in a, in a culture with wealth and influence, which came from being tied to Rome. They didn't want to hear about a king being born that would rise up and, and, and rally the Jewish people. The Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, didn't want to hear about a king of the Jews, a religious promised king and prophet, a prophecy that would be fulfilled of a Messiah. They had turned uh, worship in the temple into profitable gain for themselves. So there were many, many people that did not welcome this idea that a Jewish king was born that God had promised from ancient times. Some people still today have difficulty accepting the fact that Jesus, who was born now in hindsight over 2,000 years ago, is in fact the promised king, the promised Messiah, that God has sent for us. So these are, again, a couple of the prophecies about the birth of the Messiah that are important for us in our faith and why we believe and accept who Jesus says he is. Born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem. The third thing, and I'll wrap up here today with just this last point, and I want to show you again in the Old Testament. Going back to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel. This last prophecy we'll look at from 2 Samuel, I'm in chapter 7, is going to tell us about the lineage, the line in which, the family line in which the Messiah would be born. Very important piece of messianic prophecy, which we will see how it fits in with Jesus' birth and his being sent to earth. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16 and 17. The Bible says, Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time. Your throne will be secure forever. 
So Nathan went back to David and told him everything that the Lord had said in this vision. So Matthew 1 and 1, we were in Matthew 1 earlier, we didn't read verse 1, but it would tell us in Matthew 1 and 1 that Jesus was to be born in the line of King David, which is from the tribe of Judah. And verse 16 and 17, which we just read from 2 Samuel 7, ex explains to us that God is giving this promise to King David that his kingdom would continue forever, his throne would be forever secure. It's telling us about, again, down the line of King David, how a ruler, a king would be born, an eternal king whose throne and kingdom would be secured forever. Back to Matthew 1, verses 16 and 17, strangely enough, also explains to us how Jesus, it, it actually provides the entire lineage. Many of us skip over Matthew 1 for the most part until we get to the last bit because it just tells us this one born, this one, this one was born of this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. It gets all the way down to tell us that Joseph, who is legally in the line of King David, and it records then that he is married to Mary who bears a son, Jesus. So, Joseph being the legal heir within the line of King David, not the natural father of Jesus, but in ancient times considered to be the legal guardian, the legal father because of his marriage to Mary. And so, we see Jesus then tied to the line of King David by virtue of Joseph. And... In Isaiah, back to Isaiah chapter 9 is where we kind of started this whole conversation in the book of Isaiah 7. Just jump over to Isaiah 9, and I want to read verse, just verse 6 here. We're getting ready to wind down. Isaiah then would later continue this prophecy that he began with to King Ahaz, this promise of Emmanuel being born, God with us. He says this about this child. It says, a child is born to us. A son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6, again, a familiar Christmas passage that we often quote. The Isaiah, the prophecies in Isaiah are written at a very dark time in the history of God's people. The Israelites were facing exile and, and Judah, the tribe that King Ahaz is king over, is full of sin and full of idolatry and moral decline. They too would end up eventually in exile. The future looked dark and bleak at the time of Isaiah's prophecies when it's recorded for us. But yet he is pointing towards this incredible day and this incredible time when a great deliverer, which we just read, would be born, a mighty counselor, <laughs> when all injustice and oppression would be gone, the Messiah would be given. And his prophecy in, in Isaiah 9 and 6 that we just read, it's not just talking about the ministry of Jesus on earth. Some of it is fulfilled in Jesus' arrival and what he stood for when he walked the earth back 2,000 years ago. But more of it points to the future, rule and reign, the eternal kingdom that Jesus will eventually set up when he comes back again. And so we're piecing together prophecy from Old Testament bringing us to the early gospel accounts when Jesus is born and we're seeing how it fits together. But we also, as believers, in asking and answering this question of who is Jesus and why do we believe he is who he says he is, we're keeping our eye then on the future, on what he has also promised and what these prophecies also point us towards in light of eternity. So I hope that you have been blessed by our study again tonight on the Messiah 
and we intend to be back online next week on Tuesday again, so we invite you to join us. If you are in our area, we'd love for you to join us Sunday, Sunday morning at 1030 for a live in-person service. We'd be glad to have you. And if you're not in our area, you're not able to make it Sunday morning, we will have an online service at 630 on Sunday, which we'd be glad for you to join us as well. And may God richly bless you. Keep looking into God's Word. Keep searching and studying daily and asking God for His help. May God bless you.